I want to tell you a story, actually, something that happened to me uh, in my organization a couple of weeks ago. So it's very fresh, hot off the press. We had an overseas visitor who was coming to inspect our IPC services. Inspect sounds a bit formal. They were coming to have a look around and see how we did things in England. And I took them to one of our ICUs at one of our sites. And we were standing there in the middle of the ICU, and I was explaining what it was, mixed specialty, um, mainly surgical, some other patients as well come through here. <clears throat> and out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a, a, a member of the team uh, delivering some care. And I was thinking, hmm, you've got some gloves on there, haven't you? Let's just keep an eye on that interaction and see where it goes. And the longer we looked at it, the, the more interesting it became, shall we say. So it began with uh, a ventilator. That, so that, that was disconnected following donning some gloves. I didn't see hand hygiene before the gloves went on. I might have missed that. So the ventilator was disconnected. Uh, it was fiddled with. The, the tubing fell on the floor. The tubing was picked up, put back on. And then with the same pair of gloves, the member of the team went back to the patient, muted a couple of the alarms, and then pulled back the blanket. I was thinking, there's a line there. And went straight in, had a good fiddle with the line, and then that was the end of the interaction. So you, you can just, you can, you can see, can't you, how that is not good, and the, the infection transmission risks uh, in that episode are palpable. And yeah, that's just normal. That's everyday practice in an ICU. Um, this is happening if you work in a healthcare organization, in your organization day in, day out. And it's a risk we really need to talk about, to out, and find a way to, to manage. Talking to that individual healthcare professional, which I did only very briefly just to say, do you know when you put your gloves on? Do you realize what you did with them and the risk you introduced? And they said, yeah, sorry about that. I hadn't thought it through. That's a drop in the ocean. That's not going to change practice. We need to have something much more systemic, much more powerful, um, bring in the, the noise of all the voices and the leadership that we, that we can in order to begin to address the issue with gloves. So we need to talk about gloves. I've got a couple of disclosures um, there for you to take a look at. OK, so that's what we're going to have a think about today. Um, I've been doing a little delve into the evidence. I had a little read of the, um, the Scottish uh, review on glove use. I don't know whether anybody's had a look at it. It's quite a long document, but it's really very good. There's some information in EPIC 3 as well about the, the rationale behind glove use and, and in the National Infection Control Manual. So I'll be drawing on those, on those sources um, and, and covering a little bit of literature We'll have a think about when we, when we use gloves, what the recommendations are, and what's behind them. Which gloves to use, an area we maybe don't talk about so much. Um, what's wrong with gloves? There's a lot wrong with gloves. And then how we, can, how we can move towards best practice. So why gloves? Do we have any Formula One fans in the house? Anybody know what this is? Who this is? So it's a Verstappen, but it's not, it's not Max. It's Jos Verstappen with a, with a pit fire in, I think it was the 1990s, quite a long time ago now. And this was a classic human factors issue. There was a little widget or a, or a seal in a fuel line that hadn't been put in properly manually. There was a fuel leak. There was heat on the engine. And kaboom, big fireball. Now, amazing nobody was injured due to the incredible protective equipment they were wearing. But, but the point is, um, the... The, immediate, the impact of this failure in, in process and practice was instant and highly, highly memorable. I really wish every failure in hand hygiene looked like that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if there was a huge fireball every time somebody wore gloves for too long or didn't wash their hands? Because you wouldn't do it again, would you? Or at least you wouldn't do it again without thinking about it. But it's not like that with hand hygiene. It's not like that with glove use. Because the impact is, is delayed, sometimes negligible, and um, almost always unseen and unlinkable to the failure. So we have a fundamentally challenging scenario here of getting across the importance of the messaging around hand hygiene and linked to that glove use. 
So why do we wash our hands? We can go back to Semmelweis. We can look at some, some very early data showing that introducing a hand washing step at that stage dramatically reduced the rates of awful peripheral sepsis in these, in these mums. Um, the story was um, members of staff were going straight from the mortuary to the delivery suite and not washing their hands in between when a hand washing step was introduced. Unsurprisingly now to us, that there was a significant change in outcomes, but then before germ theory had really landed um, or been invented, th it, this, was, this was a surprise and it took a while to catch on. We have some more modern data now. Um, this is a, a study that, that really kicked things off in terms of hand hygiene, showing that uh, improving hand hygiene uh, resulted in reduced healthcare associated infection hospital wide. Uh, and it's really powerful and, and quite beautiful data. So hand hygiene is really important. I, I don't really need to tell you that, but this is, this is the why. So hands become contaminated during patient care. If you wash them, it reduces the burden. Um, we know hand hygiene reduces poor outcomes and improving hand hygiene results in fewer healthcare associated infections. A really big chunk of hand hygiene performance failures are to do with gloves. If you go out there and you stand on your ward and you do an audit of practice, um, quite a, a significant number of your hand hygiene failures that you mark on whatever system you're using uh, will, be, will be to do with, with gloves being worn inappropriately. So these two issues go hand in hand. Hand in glove, maybe. So why would we use, why would we use gloves? Uh, I just got a really bad look from somebody in the audience. Sorry about that. OK, so why would we use gloves? Um, so when I went back to the literature, it, I, 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 need to, I need to maybe do a little bit more work uh, and a bit more digging, but I, I didn't find the kind of slam dunk data that I was really expecting here um, around, around the use case for gloves. I mean, there's a lot of data, don't get me wrong, but, but not many high quality randomized controlled trials, systematic reviews, meta-analyses. Um, it, it's based on data from, from a previous era with a different standard of, of, um, of evidence. Now, that's not to say there isn't good reason and good evidence for using gloves sometimes. So there's quite a few studies that show if you use gloves, you're, you're less likely to wash your hands if the patient has an antibiotic-resistant organism. Um, we'll come back to that, because that's a really interesting point. Um, it's certainly true, but, but that may not be such a powerful, compelling case for using gloves at least all of the time. But the, the study here, this one here um, from JAMA, in the top left panel, sorry, top right panel, is a bit more um, uh, helpful in a way because it's to do with contact with mucous membranes. So it was a study evaluating the acquisition of hands of, of um, potentially significant organisms following contact with mucous membranes. And what they showed is that, that gloves significantly became contaminated during those contacts that hands otherwise would have been contaminated by. Um, Interestingly, um, microbial contamination of the healthcare worker hands, despite wearing gloves, occurred on around 13% of occasions. And the theory is that during glove removal, the hand became contaminated. And that's why we say when you remove your gloves, you should do hand hygiene, because we don't do that in a way that means that we don't get contamination on our hands. Um, also, and this is quite shocking actually, um, micro punctures or leaks were found in a really high proportion of gloves, and yet only around 20% of those were recognized by staff. So gloves aren't a panacea, they aren't foolproof, we're not putting bulletproof gauntlets on our hands, we're putting a quite thin layer of plastic most of the time. So gloves reduce the risk, but they don't eliminate the risk, and I think the, the comment from Epic 3 there summarizes nicely the, the evidence and the key use case for gloves. Um, that they reduce the risk of hand contamination, blood, body fluid secretions and excretions, but do not eliminate the risk. Okay, when to use gloves? So there's a, there's a quick answer to this, and then a slightly more complicated and nuanced answer, and depending on how much time there is, we'll, we'll delve into a few of the uncertainties towards the end of our time. So, um, the National Infection Control Manual in England is a really helpful resource. Um, it's got some great sections on PPE uh, and on gloves. Um, under standard precautions, there's really good, clear advice about a risk assessment that we should un undertake before every patient contact, and that should inform 
the type of PPE that we use based on the risks in front of us. There is a specified aim, and this is great to minimize the use of PPE. We want to be aiming for the minimal safe level of PPE, unlike COVID. You remember the beginning of COVID? The hats, the coats, the scarves, the overcoats, the welly boots, everything was being layered on and on and on and on in an attempt to make things safer, and it was doing exactly the opposite. It was making things less safe because everything was getting contaminated because people didn't have a clue what they were doing. So I really love this, this angle of minimal use uh, of safe PPE. Safer, more sustainable, cheaper. It's a win-win-win. So um, gloves should be used for, uh, for contact with a single patient all the time. PPE, very occasionally, is sessional, and that means used for more than one patient contact at the same time. For gloves, it's single patient. So when to wear gloves? There's some use cases for gloves under standard and fetch control precautions, and that's principally when it's wet or sticky or not yours. So that's the simple rule of thumb as to when to use gloves. If it's wet or sticky or not yours, wear gloves. Almost every other time, you're good. So, so that's, that's the starting point. Um, slightly more eloquently, um, body, body fluid exposure, non-intact non skin, mucous membranes. Sometimes we need sterile gloves in a relatively small number of cases. Um, and sometimes we need to wear gloves when we're undertaking exposure-prone procedures. Under transmission-based precautions, so these are the precautions that we use for, for patients who have specific infection risks. Um, the, the advice is to use gloves when caring for patients who are on droplet or airborne precautions. Interestingly, for patients on contact precautions, there's not necessarily a use case for gloves. So if there's no body fluid exposure and you're not anticipating high levels of contact with, with areas of the body that are, that are highly, uh, likely to be highly colonized, you don't always need to wear gloves. Now, this is a, this is a shift in our thinking. Uh, and, and again, if we have time, we'll come back to that. Um, also, when caring for patients with a high consequence infectious disease um, for which there are, there are separate PPE recommendations. So here we have a nice um, visual summary from the National Infection Control Manual of um, where to wear gloves under, under standard precautions. I won't go into that in any detail. Um, there's some helpful advice on, on when to put gloves on and when to take them off. Um, I remember quite early in my career, I was, I was doing some work with prions. Uh, I can't remember quite why I was doing that now. But th they were very, very careful about how to put gloves on and take gloves off because they knew they had these prions on their gloves in this laboratory setting, and they really didn't want to get them on their body so that you could see they were thinking, okay, which, which part of this glove is contaminated, and how am I not going to get it on my hands when I take this glove off? And it's useful to have that same mentality. I remember during COVID, we, had, um, we teamed up with, with some unusual um, professional groups. Um, I say unusual, they probably thought we were unusual. What I mean is professional groups we don't often link with in infection control. Um, they were redeployed to us as PPE helpers, we called them, and they, and they helped us to improve PPE behaviors at that time when everybody was wearing the multiple layers of PPE. And what we found is that, the, that those involved in, in working with radioisotopes made brilliant PPE helpers because they were used to working with, with, in high-risk environments with stuff you really don't want to get onto you. And yet they had a really cool head, and they told us all to think, okay, why am I wearing this item of PPE? Which bit of the PPE is likely to be contaminated, and how do I avoid getting that on my hands? So we plugged, as you can see here, the logic is that, is that you want to put them on without contaminating the outside of the glove with your flora, and you want to take them off without contaminating your hands with, with the bits of gloves that are likely to be contaminated. So you can, you can think this through logically most of the time. So under transmission-based precautions, as I said, there is, there is now, and I think this is great, um, a, a way out of wearing gloves all the time for contact precautions. It, to, to the point where you begin to say, well, what, what is different between contact precautions and standard precautions done well? And the answer is not much if, if, the, if both sets of precautions are done well. Um, so I, I'm personally really in favor of this idea, and I think it's something we should all apply some thought to to say, well, when do we really need to wear gloves, even during contact precautions? Because you could, you could argue, well, 
the skin of this patient that I'm likely to touch, the intact skin, not the, the sticky, wet, and not yours bit, but the intact skin is likely to be contaminated as well. So I'm going to get an MDRO on my hand. I'm going to get contaminated with an antibody-resistant organism. Yeah, OK, true. But that could happen during contact with any patient, any of the time, because we have loads of patients with unrecognized colonization. And you're going to wash your hands after the patient contact or before you do your sterile procedure. Um, so, so that if we do good hand hygiene and standard precautions, then, then we ought not to need gloves for all patient contacts, even when there's a patient on contact precautions. So this is a, a, helpful, um, a helpful slide from the WHO, um, which shows you a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is where we need sterile gloves. Um, the middle of the pyramid is, is for non-sterile gloves. And the bottom of the pyramid is, is for no gloves at all. Now, if you look, at, you look at every single word on that, I will guarantee that everybody working in fetch control will not agree with every word. So there is some, there is some points for discussion on where things fall. My own view is that I want to get people to talk about this issue and to think about this issue and begin to bring those controversies to the, to the forefront so that when we go to our clinical colleagues, we can have um, not necessarily a, a homogenous voice, but at least have had aired the discussions and really challenged our own thinking and understood what, why, we're, why we're thinking what we think. So briefly, some gloves. Do's and don'ts, um, I, I think most of this is, is pretty straightforward and, and intuitive, really. But double gloving, um, it, it, there's, there's some, some very rare um, needs for double gloving in, in healthcare. Most people won't need to do it at all. We don't need gloves for administrative tasks. That, that hopefully is clear. Absolutely changing between patients um, if there's a perforation. We need to make sure they're appropriate for use, well-fitting and, uh, and, and fit for purpose. No decontamination of gloves. We know it doesn't work very well. Um, be considerate about sensitization issues, particularly with the materials that are being chosen from a procurement point of view. Um, appropriate to the tasks, and, and as I mentioned, think about the way that they're put on and put off in order to minimize risk. OK, so which, which gloves then do we, do we use? I haven't looked into this in, in, in a great deal of detail until recently. Uh, and the more I look into it, the more I think this is actually really important and probably should be part of our, our expertise and our, um, and our discussions within our day jobs. Um, so how do we choose a glove that is, as I mentioned on the previous slide, um, appropriate for use, fit for purpose, and well-fitting, and one that is appropriate for the task being undertaken? Um, we, just This is a, a separate illustration, but hopefully shows the point. Uh, my, my organization recently changed gowns, disposable gowns, and um, they brought in some very low-cost gowns that weren't brilliant. And what happened was they kept ripping. So they had to use two gowns every time they wanted to use one gown, and it ended up being a false economy. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's elements of that in glove choice as well, um, because the, there's, there's better, all gloves are not created equal. So there's some key measures of, of gloves that we should be thinking about. One is AQL. So that's how many gloves in a batch are defective. So gloves with a, a low AQL can have something like 86% reduction in defect rate compared with a, high, a higher AQL. So low AQL is good, high AQL is bad. On the other hand, tensile strength, this is how, how far you can pull it before it snaps. You know, the old advert where you're pulling. Um, some have a higher tensile strength, which is good, and, and a lower tensile strength, and that will affect how often they tear. Um, packaging and dispensing is important too. How many times have you gone to a box, pulled out a glove, and got three? Well, what happens to the other two? Either they go back in the box, which is a contamination risk, or in your pocket for later, or they, get, they go in the bin, which is an over-dispensed risk and a cost. Um, and supply chain as well. Um, some of the stuff about glove supply chain will make you weep, or should make you weep, around the, the, the forced labor that, that's involved in some of the aspects of the ethical supply chain, and, and a very low pro price point uh, isn't helping us. Um, if you've heard Mood, Mood Booter talk, he's very outspoken about issues with the supply chain, uh, and, and there's, some, there's some lots in the public domain about this. Um, so I think these are, these are issues that, that should be part of our conversation about gloves. What happens if we get it wrong? Well. Um, if we choose non-sterile gloves when sterile gloves are indicated, 
we create an infection risk. Um, if we uh, have inadequate glove quality, there's infection risk. Uh, and if, if there's incorrect dispensing, as I said, there may be infection risk if we go down the pocket route. Um, equally, the, the flip side of those same points, if we use sterile gloves when we could be using non-sterile gloves, then we're overusing gloves or, or, or using more expensive gloves than we need to. Um, if we are over dispensing, again, we're overusing gloves. Over, over specified non-sterile gloves as well. So if we're, if we're using a, a higher cost, higher quality non-sterile glove, when we could be getting away with a lower quality, cheaper uh, glove, that, then equally that, that's an, an example of glove overuse equally. I also think we should be thinking beyond the sterile, non-sterile question, that there's more to be talking about, that there may be a middle ground. So increasingly, um, most of our surgery is not a big cut with a knife and, and, and a huge surgical wound. Minimally invasive procedures um, and minor procedures are much, much more the, the, the growth area. Um, whether we need sterile gloves for all of those procedures and when we can step down to non-sterile gloves is a really open question. There's lots of literature with conflicting findings on this point. Um, and there's similar questions around exposed prone procedures and HSIT. So I think there probably is, there is space in our hospitals for a higher quality non-sterile glove, um, as well as sterile gloves and non-sterile gloves. But, but this will require thought and discussion for us to get right. So what's wrong with gloves? Um, Jenny Wilson shared this slide with me um, from one of her studies. It's actually very similar to the, to the, to the example we started with. So it's not just me, it's not just my hospitals, thank goodness. There's others who have observed the same thing. Um, and, and, the, and the case on the left, this was a single episode of care, single pair of gloves, trolley, IV, IV, central line, IV, 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 lines, bed control, IV. So you can just see how the organisms are, are getting from contaminated surfaces potentially in this IV. So what's wrong, what's wrong with, with gloves? There's a whole load of behavioral psychology going on here. Um, our self-protection reflex is really, really strong. It's a huge driver for hand hygiene activities, good and bad. Um, gloves provide a false sense of security for staff who feel protected and don't necessarily do hand hygiene when they take them off. Gloves go on at the start of the shift and they come off at the end. Okay, it's not quite that bad, but that, that's the kind of mentality. Um, they tend to be worn for way too long. Um, if we ask patients what they think about gloves, it's kind of a mixed view. I, I think probably COVID has changed things slightly in that, in that the use of gloves became normalized during patient care, and that's maybe set an expectation for, for, for patients that healthcare is delivered with gloves, which is not a good place to be. Um, this is data from the pre-COVID era, but certainly the majority of patients asked didn't like being cared for with gloves. It made them feel contaminated or dirty. Um, and they much prefer to be cared for with bare hands. Gloves add mountains to the, to the ever-increasing pile of plastic waste in hospitals. They cost money, they're not free, um, and they cause and exacerbate skin health for staff. There's a shocking RCN survey um, that, that showed that something like 50% of, of frontline healthcare workers have had some kind of skin dermatitis linked to their workplace, much of which is to do with hand hygiene activity and gloves. So here's a picture from the pandemic. Somebody in the supermarket wearing their gloves. It's, a, it's an image we've all seen and is probably sort of imprinted on our brains. Uh, and it's, it's, it's absolutely without, without doubt that the pandemic drove glove use. Um, the next slide may give you flashbacks. Anybody recognize one of these? A little PP table that happened that was sent out by central government during COVID. It gives me nightmares still today. And here we go. Um, during patient care, disposal gloves for every patient contact. It's, it's what we were doing. I really, really wish we hadn't. I wish we'd pu pushed back on it. It's one of my regrets from the pandemic because um, I felt at the time we didn't need to use gloves at every patient contact. If they became contaminated with SARS-CoV-2, fragile, envelope virus, easy to get rid of with hand hygiene, but um, it, it wasn't to be. And this was the impact. I mean, look at that, that cumulative use of gloves in the NHS was pretty huge to begin with. Um, 1.7 trillion, no, billion, 1.7 billion gloves. Um, and by the end of the 
the pandemic, post-pandemic period, 12 billion gloves used in the NHS. That is an awful lot of gloves and an awfully big increase. Uh, the percentage increase actually for gloves was the lowest of all PPE, but still a very significant percentage increase. So, as I said, glove use doesn't come without cost. Um, here we have some gloves um, making a mark in terms of carbon footprint. You multiply that by 12 billion, it's a pretty significant increase. And where does it go? Uh, it, it has to go somewhere, sometimes very sadly, even into the ocean. But even if it goes in the correct supply chain, there's, there's environmental cost of waste. Um, this is the steps on the way into St. Thomas's. I took that photo one morning with my own fair hand of a glove, um, just discarded on the way in. I'm sure it was a hospital glove, probably discarded on the way out. Maybe it fell out of somebody's pocket because they'd over dispensed it earlier. Okay, so what can we do? Well, how can we begin to address some of these issues that, that have been, um, that, that, that are there with, with gloves? I, I've mentioned this PPE helper program before. It was one of the most interesting things I did, um, in fact, was to look at early phase of the pandemic. We knew we were using far too much PPE. We knew there was huge amounts of anxiety around the use of PPE. Um, we were able to put a team together, and what, one of the key components of the team was a behavioral psychologist. So they happened to be redeployed to IPC, and their skill set was something I'd never had access to in that way before, and it was invaluable. They were able to come in and say, look, let's use a behavior change model, COMBI, where we give, um, wh where we, where we give staff what they need in order to change their behavior. Because it, w we can talk, and we can try, and we can y use things that have been done elsewhere, and that's great, but there's science behind behavior change, and, and perhaps we're slightly behind the the curve in terms of uh, applying that, that type of science in terms of the behavior change that we're trying to affect with an IPC. One thing that came out of the pandemic was that dynamic risk assessments and the use of PPE um, will, will, will never be the same again. Um, and, and there's good in that. I, I want staff to be thoughtful and to think about the way they're using PPE. If a member of staff is using more PPE than I would personally choose, but they can justify to me rationally why they're using that PPE, I feel that's job done. That they've gone through a process of dynamic risk assessment. They might have ended up in a different place to me. That's okay. As long as they're not using loopy logic, then, then, then I feel that's okay. Um, and, and this PPE helper program seemed to work. It improved um, the, the knowledge of the staff and improved the behavior of the staff when it came to choices around PPE. So if I was to do a survey of the room and ask you whether you think we should use gloves for contact precautions, and experts within IPC will have a divided opinion. Some people will say, we should always use gloves when we're touching a patient for contact precautions. Others will say, we don't always need to do that. I'm in the latter camp. But if you're in the former camp, let's talk about it. I think we, that's the sort of dialogue that, that we need to have here. I mentioned at the start, how do we change their behavior of that, of that individual I, I saw in the ICU that day. Speaking to them, challenging their behavior on an individual level, it's not gonna make a scrap of difference. It might do for them for the next episode. It might do for them for the rest of their career, who knows? But it's not gonna change our organizational management of this issue. So we need to have some coordinated activities um, to give staff the, 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 the skills and, and the permission in order to reduce our glove use. So this is the, the, the um, Great Ormond Street campaign with the dinosaur because it was a pediatric setting and they talk in, in dinosaurs um, and, and they showed that they were able to reduce their use of gloves by, um, by means of a trust-wide campaign. We've had a go at Guys and Tommies. We, we launched a campaign that was called Glove or No Glove a couple of years ago. Uh, we didn't initially go for gloves off. We thought it sounded like a Friday night outside the pub, um, which wasn't quite the image we wanted. Um, and We've had some success. People listened to the campaign. We've seen some pockets where glove use has reduced. Um, but we've also learned a lot um, about how to land this campaign. Um, we did some comms, we did some branding, uh, and had some success. Um, we're actually going to have another go at launching the campaign as gloves off later on this year um, with a bit of increased learning. One of the things that we didn't really nail down was vascular access. And what our advice was about vascular access. 
So we had lots of people coming to us and saying, well, okay, what about preparing an IV? What about manipulating a line what's inserted? What about putting an IV through? When do I wear gloves? And they were getting different answers from the team, reasonably, because there's controversy in the literature around exactly those points. So we've spent some time getting around the table trying to be clearer about, about what our messaging is on those points. And that's been a really, a really um, good, open discussion, and I feel we're making some progress there. So we don't want to totally homogenize opinion, as I said, but we do want to be something like on the same page so that we can have clear, consistent advice to our stakeholders. So um, I hope that's been a useful beginning to a discussion about gloves, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you.